at the start there was nothing and then there was a black dot a black dot the black dot expanded a bit and it expanded a bit and it expanded a bit more the blackness taking hold of everything this blackness was space and time itself and that's at least how we understand it it was a fast expansion that took a few nanoseconds and it became this shape and in this shape black in all that blackness white dot appeared a whiteness that would explode with a force unyielding it would fill like a star lots of blackness and while the blackness grew so did the light this light was not just any ordinary light it was matter itself it was negative and positive it was antimatter in matter and it collided in it in on itself multiple times while the blackness expanded and now across all the blackness there were dots of light and that light was hot that's why it was light it wouldn't have been light white light if it wasn't glowing so at that time in that form the nothingness around the universe wanted to collapse it back destroy it and so it did it shot back into the into the universe and the universe wasn't strong enough it was spread too thin it collapsed slowly but surely and the light collapsed with it as it collapsed it screamed in agony and it go it went back to zero to one dot the daring universe tried again and this time it would be different it would still start with the black dot and it would still expand and it would still produce white light but it would produce it earlier and this was the key you see as the black expanded even more the nothingness had no force to absolve its crimes because white would take the place of any blackness that formed this time it would be different because there was not enough blackness but too much light and as light grew it completely covered the whole of blackness until nothing but white remained and even then it tried to create new space but it couldn't because it was just matter and so it became a white blob a completely white blob but that wasn't enough it wanted to expand even harder so naturally it ripped it ripped into smaller pieces which also wanted to expand more and so they did rip and rip and rip and rip and rip and rip and rip all the way down until nothing remained yet again the universe needed a new plan it would start with blackness yet again and it would expand slowly and then super fast while light was not even there it created space time and then it would create light in the middle of it and that light those dots would see to the early universe it wouldn't rip this time it wouldn't get consumed by nothingness it would be perfect a new great light and so the universe was born 
But these were not the only challenges of the universe. As you see, there was so much light, and so did it brightly glow. You see, the blackness did not stop expanding, but it did it at a slow rate, as to not get consumed by the relentless and unyielding nothingness. And so it grew, and with it, the light grew as well. But then, something happened. A, gra a gravitational force appeared, and pulled light together. Now, it wasn't just mere nothingness that existed. It was forces, and those forces created the first particles that existed. And those particles were in many forms, matter and antimatter. And when that collided, it produced such big shock waves that it destroyed so much matter and then made it again. And then again showed much matter. And then it made it again. And then the universe was not empty like I'm showing now, but was filled small pieces of light. These smallish pieces of light were pockets of antimatter. Because you see, for every one trillionth of matter that appeared, there was one trillion and one particle of antimatter. And that compounded. It became truly a wondrous event. And the first clouds formed. First clouds formed. These clouds were spread about the beautiful universe. And the black expanded. It expanded so much that it filled all visible space in all directions. But there was an end. No one could just see it. And so the white expanded as well to fill the gaps and the voids of the early universe. It was beautiful. It was charming. This light slowly faded from you and a new picture appeared, a picture of unimaginable quality, of a small positron and a large, very large, antiproton. They formed the first cloud, electron cloud, around each other, and therefore the first atom. This was the second light after the explosion. Now there were so many of these that they coalesced into said clouds. But these clouds had no color now because there were little there was little light left all around. They couldn't illuminate it. And then it happened. Clouds formed into the first anti star. This was the first anti star, and the universe was peaceful. Many more anti stars were made all around the vacant universe. They were born, and soon, after a million years, they would die in an explosion so magnificent it created the third light of the universe. And in that blackness, after it settled, there was more matter. And this matter 
again tried to form the stars. But this time, there was not just anti-electrons with anti-protons in anti-hydrogen atoms and anti-helium atoms. There was more elements. Because as you see, stars, they run on fuel. They work on a nuclear anti-fusion. They coalesce all those beautiful hydrogens in the center of the star, anti-star. And they anti-fuse into helium, anti-helium, anti-lithium, anti-bor, anti-carbon, and all the way up to anti-iron. And in anti-iron, something peculiar happens. As you can see from this, the star has has a lot of matter and it all wants to go into itself but it can't because it fuses in the middle and that creates an outward push that resists the gravity that wants to destroy everything and coalesce it even harder of course when that happens it will eventually happen of course when that happens, that iron comes to shove. It does not create that outward push. It has no energy. It loses energy, actually. So the star has no other option but to go with gravity's proposal and collapse. And it grows smaller and smaller and smaller. And all that beautiful star hits the iron layer in the center and it disperses in a supernova the first anti-supernova which ignites as the fourth light again the universe has stars all around the and they coalesce into galaxies the first anti-galaxies in the center of the anti-galaxies plays something truly incredible you see when a star collapses it can create a small dwarf anti-small dwarf actually anti-neutron star where the anti-protons and anti-electrons fuse into anti-neutrons in the center and a whole star is made out of anti neutrons and of course they can collapse even further resisting the strong nuclear force that, that into anti black holes which collapse inward forever they are in the center of the galaxy as huge pulsars Quasars and Magnetars, they rid the galaxy. The accretion disk, all the stuff around the black hole, the anti-black hole, goes fast, almost as fast as the speed of very light, and it creaks and shrieks, and in pain it almost dies but reincarnates as beautiful light shooting out of polar opposite directions out of the black hole the beautiful anti-black hole the blackness is now filled with light the beautiful tales of the spiraling anti-galaxy called la teta all the galaxies all the clouds gas are all around in a super cluster called Laniakea. You see, Lakeka 
is a special place. For out of the out of neutron stars which collide and and iron which is now left around the stars in gas new stars appear and after another generation two stars orbiting each other at not this distance coalesce and around them seven planets Lakuka in the system is named after the largest star called the Red Menace. Its sister, the anti-star next to it, is called Glow. Red Menace and Glow around them have seven planets. But what is important is a planet we will now consider called Khtvor. Khtvor is a wondrous planet, a planet orbiting around two stars. And this planet has a peculiar moon. A moon which appeared when it was glowing hot red and it collided, collided with a planet of other species with no name because to give it a name would be offensive. They collided and in the collision Thor became bigger and a small moon was formed called Hra. Hra was hit by another object which enlarged it. It was peculiarly large and that object was ricocheting and became the second moon Me. Thor Hra and Me were now together. They were not at this distance, but they were close. Slowly, the planet cooled and became and became beautiful. But it was not fast. It took 300 million years for the meteors that have come down to make it an ocean world. Well, that happened. Hra became blue, a beautiful crystalline blue of the shallow waters. And me, unluckily as it was, was hit repeatedly by another object and stayed red hot. Two billion years something peculiar happened. Tiny bits of rock came out of the surface of Khtvor in a first supercontinent called Veta. Veta was large. It ca covered approximately 7% of the planet's surface. Something similar happened at Khra. But it was a small island chain and it had no name. Then Me cooled and it was beautiful, a beautiful white like a marble on a summer day where the waves are beautiful and the sky is reddish. Two stars can be seen as blue dots, but our story begins underwater, in the deep, deep waters of the black abyss. Here, on the very surface, there are veins of lava flowing out, cooling and such. 
And here, there is a special solution in water. It is called nothing. It has no name. Not yet. There is a green. Olive green. Mineral all around these wings. It is quite special. Because it is porous. And it is so porous in fact. Molecules can be trapped in it. In warm, warmish water, they can be trapped. And I'm going to draw that here. Here, the first molecules are made. And with that first life, it takes places simple chain of molecules. And it slowly becomes more complex. Now, not much is known about this process, as there was no one yet there to fill it. But it soon encompassed such a large part of the planet that evolution started. Evolution of organisms. In the beautiful waters, a ray light Rays of light hit the water, and the first beings learned to use that light in a process called photosynthesis. They were purple, and they were many. There were so many, in fact, that they had a new name, Araniotera. They soon, a red variant, learned to eat the others. And this species was called Utera. Utera was nasty. They killed. They ate. They became larger and larger. And so, a cold war of sorts cr was created. Now, the first life, Araniopterra, created lots of antioxidant which from the water went up to the air it took all that carbon dioxide anti-carbon dioxide and converted it into beautiful oxygen anti-oxygen which changed the color of the very sky into blue and now we will do a time skip. A time skip. This is the water and this is the beautiful air. And the suns now have a beautiful yellow orange color. They come and they go. And the life is turnipos and beautiful. Turn across the beautiful waters. And uh, against the floor of the ocean thing is life just keeps on going and then something magnificent happened a cambrian explosion which marks the first large period of life on Hvor. now there are organisms which had multiple cells on them, which worked together. And they were called Ubatasu. Ubatasu were varied. At first, they hang out on the ocean floor, which was near the surface. They were mud colored. The first ones were simple lines and circles. The circles were called Yari and the lines were called Uyari. Past Uyari defeated Yari as they had a more surface area. 
and so only Yari remained. Only Uyari remained, I'm sorry. Then there was a third species which had a bit more oomph, a curvature of sorts, stemming of the main body, and they took over Uyari. They were called Yayari, they were cross shaped. Then something magnificent happened. The first instance, the recording of an earthquake, which separated the two Yari from the ground. They were now separate, and on each side, a new color variant appeared. On Yayari left side, a green variant appeared, which overtook the old Yayari, and a purple variant on the right side, which overtook the right Yayari. The green were called Unari, and the purple were called Unananari. That was the first multicellular distinction. This is the story of Unari and Unenari for their beef goes forever. As you can see they were different and the earthquake separated them. But that was not all their past. You see what actually happened was they were simple organisms, and I'm gonna draw that now. They were on the ground, obviously, and I'm gonna draw Unari now. Unari and all those before them, which were green now, were actually a collection of small microorganisms which built. The structure, but the structure was not green, <laughs> you see. <coughs> what made the structure green was small, beautifully seen about other microorganisms called Ia. And on the right side, we can see the purple, which were called which had the same basic shape and the same microorganism that built the thing. But another, another species of microorganism went in, which were called Ya. Yeah. They both performed photosynthesis and they both worked just fine. But you wouldn't guess how far their fight goes. As you see, when life evolves, it becomes other things. And this fight does not stop at sedimentary life. They had purple and they had green colors, but they did not earn those colors. They just got them because they needed them to survive. Both species, both species, had a trick up their sleeve. They needed to live in the, the the beautiful cocoon made by them by the other microorganisms. But what they what they didn't so there were no multicellular on organisms still on Earth. They were still a bit disconnected. But Ya and Ya would change that. They both evolved into something, something, something insane. They both evolved into circles. Gia yeah, into red, into green circles, and Gia into purple circles. These circles were not just one cell. There were multiple cells, 
because you see ya and ya were living in the tanks but they needed to reproduce and they couldn't do that on the same organism lest they will be rid with incest they had a solution make a thing that goes out of you out of the, the branch and to other branches and it reproduces by hooking to another spore but that was only that good it was wind of the sea going out of their way it wasn't guided so they made guided is missiles they evolved to send multiple stuck cells together and slowly they were circles then they got fins they got fins they could swim after a while a thing appeared a spore of ia and somehow a spore of gia which decided to not return to the mother tree but to reproduce and then stay there and so a new life form was formed called for the green versions Gitter and for the purple version Niter. Now all life was tied to this. All life was tied to the branches. The branches would send their code, make the thing, detach the thing, the thing would swim, make others, put them and slowly put them into the branches. So life evolved. From just fish, small things crawling on the surface to giants which ate their own with jaws with eyes which now evolved how did eyes evolve? Mitter were the first beings to evolve eyes Gitter followed by only 5 million years you see Mitter made cells that could respond to light then slowly it would go from a beautiful flat surface to a curved one to an even curved one and even more until it was a pinhole with neurons they connect to their new found brains and all, the, all they then need to do was to make the, the transparent part a glass part and then they had eyes now Yitter and Mitter roll around the globe the earth changed a bit the earth was now more Veta the supercontinent became larger and the Veta supercontinent split into two they covered together 20% of the land surface of the planet's surface of Kvor both species after a while of trying they needed the branches the branches needed to stay in the water and in the water they would live and they would re reproduce and they would still be dependent on the water but now a species managed to go out and the first was Yeter I'm sorry I misspoke Yeter did not develop eyes before going on to land they only developed eyes, eyes while on land and now I shall represent territory of Yeter and then after a few million years meter managed to go out as well and this is meter now in the water there was 
microorganisms. And those microorganisms lived on either side of the Great Schism. The Great Schism is a mysterious event. It happened early in planet's history. It is what made the earthquake which separated the two the same species into two camps. It divide this is the line that shows how the world was divided underground. It was underwater into a large schism. A valley of sorts. No species could really go uh, uh, over another. But microorganisms floating could. And it was exactly meter purple microorganisms which dominated the water the waters. They were all around the world in pockets of shallow water. They were beautifully illuminating translucent even and over the great schism as well the continents were moving and they now had a name the green continent the yitter continent was named otto and the purple continent was named veta prime they changed over the years and they evolved they were close to the coastlines because they couldn't really travel far without going back to their spore mounds. But that would soon change. Because you know all that all back where we talked about Ubatasu. Ubatasu were the structures. Uh, well, the structures built at the, by the yeah, multicellular kind of organisms which were, they would make Yari, and Uyari, and Yari, and then the schism would happen. But before then, after that, they would now try to go over water. And that would prove to be massively successful. They would go above land. And I will represent them like this. And they would fill all that land with beautiful, radiant, purple and green. If someone were to look at the planet from afar, it would be seeming as a joke. A beautiful green and a beautiful purple. Today, we are following one place. And you can vote in the comments, which one will it be? I'm waiting, still waiting. All right, vote in. It is Mithr, the purple spores. The purple spores obviously had their own chain of islands. The biggest continent was Veta Prime. And Veta Prime was special. It was purple. It was beautiful. But I'm not gonna go with your suggestion. I will go to the other side. The Otto. The green spore continent. Otto and Unari on them, which were the green spores, developed fast. And after a while, there was a mutation in the autogenome that made the forests, which we now call the forests, but, but the auto, the, the unary spores, no, not spores, the, the unary branches, they made them black. And that trait suck. And now you had a continent of black forests competing ruthlessly with each other, and green animals roaming on it. Now say goodbye to Nanari and Gia and Meter Purple and Veta Prime, because we're going to talk to them later. Now we're going to talk about Otto and everything that happened on it. I'm going to 
draw something now. See, this is land. It has blue skies. It is black from the grass. Because now all those beautiful species had new kinds of branches. Some branches were tall and wanted to reach the sky to find their warmth. They became something akin to trees, we know. Others were grassy and and like and like that. You see? Grassy. And I was grassy. You see, green creatures roamed this earth. They developed into simple legged creatures which grazed the beautiful black foliage of other species and sometimes even cannibalously. They would eat the spore mounds. Then they would reproduce with their new sexual organs and it, they would make new spores which they would place on the ground which had which had uh, uh, ubatasu on them and ubatasu would tasu the spore makers uh, no, no, spore, the, the mound makers they would create a new tree or a new or a new uh, beautiful beautiful thing and then the spore mounds when they wanted to reproduce again, they were ready. They would create saplings, which would drop from the trees as new beings. Soon, carnivorous beings appeared. These carnivorous beings would kill other spore spores, which we now call animals. They would kill other animals and eat their flesh and that would be the end of the animal but the spore would live uh, the spore would die and the other spore would live and reproduce and make other trees and grasses and all the other stuff and they would make a new life and so it was that a large cataclysm happened to otter. You see, there were a few species of otter on otter. There was the grazer, the eater of grazers, and there was a small type which would climb and live on the larger trees. Slowly, the small type gained uh, the upper hand because they found something akin to wings. And became something akin to flying swirls. This was cold, and yeet gained flight, which massively expanded its empire. Yeet was amazing, but it died off in a cataclysmic eruption called the Great Dying. Where everything almost died. The 99.999% of species which lived on Otto would die. So many species in fact died. That on the other side of the world, on Veta Prime, on the purple continent, there was an extinction which killed 30% of all the species. And now... There were only a few species left. The flying one was gone, and only small things remained. Small bugs, worms, uh, not non-flying bugs and worms, small grazers and so on. But the trees remained. Because this world has tied fauna and, and uh, fauna, faun fauna and flora, they have it tied together in the same animal because it's the same animal they had a problem every time a species would die entirely 
on the animal front, they would lose the ability to reproduce on the other front. So it would die off as well. And so when what happened was the whole ec ecosystem was broken entirely. But that was not the end for Otto. Otto continued on. And slowly, new beings appeared. They couldn't fly, but they were there, surely. Now, unlucky how Otto is, that was not the end of their bad luck. You see, there was something coming their way. After a 10 million year period, where they evolved bigger and bigger shapes, and faster and slower, and, and so on, and armor... They couldn't be ready for something. And that was the second flying species called meat. You see, meat <laughs> was special. And it ha wasn't seen on Otto for a long time. Because one special thing called Veta Prime. On Veta Prime, a new species gained flight. And it was a carnivorous species. And this carnivorous species flew over from, from Veta Prime to land on Otto. And now the skies were filled with deadly enemies, which had traveled a lot of kilometers, like a lot of kilometers, thousands of kilometers away from their home just to feast. And they would do exactly that. They would eat, they would feast, and they would go right back home on a seasonal flight. This would happen or this would happen all over the beaches of Otto. <coughs> but they could not do something. <laughs> when they tried to breed on Otto, <coughs> they would create only small pockets of new plantage. They would never create a sprawling empire like they did back on Vita Prime. Why? Why was that the case? It was simply because all the black foliage would grow significantly faster than the purple one. Because you see, light is made up of many colors. And purple absorbs only green. But black, it absorbs all colors. So indeed, Veta Prime ex uh, absorbed only a third of Otto's residents. And so it was that the first migratory species was named Mit. Mit would live it would die off, it would live again, it would die off entirely. But what happened was that Mitt would reign supreme over a continent that was not theirs. Slowly, uh, the green continent regained its greenness by having bigger and larger animals which which Mitt could not really take out because to take out a large animal you need to kill a large animal and even though Mitt was a four-legged winged flyer and it could jump with all four legs and it could fly with all four legs and it was insanely large and I'll get into how large some of Mitt was eight meters um, it couldn't kill the very large animals which now became the megafauna of meat of, of of Otto and the megafauna of Otto were large and I will name some species now this one is named Spendigus Spendigus is a giraffe-like grazer, not grazer, plant eater. And I'll name a cannibal, which stood on four legs, and it hunted 
everything but Spendigus called and I get this Uto. Uto was enormous. It was insanely big. And they avoided the large meat, which now mainly hunted fish. And this species, which was insanely big, was named Life would go on. And it would be a mystery to passerbys. What kind of fauna and flora looked on Veta Prime? But it wouldn't be a mystery forever. For after 150 million years, after the great dying, a species would emerge. It wouldn't emerge just as another species. It would emerge as a hunter. The first ever bipedal animal. This bipedal animal was named the first one. It would eat even, it would eat meat and it would eat fauna, fl uh, flora. It was not picky. You see, on Otto, green species were very special because they had small fifth and sixth arm or third arms for this animal called the first one they were very useful for they could grab things as well as the other arms it was a hexapod other species with hexapods as well this was the first walking bipedal hexapod and the first bipedal animal it wasn't four-legged as Spendigus, Uto and Pop have been. It came from a different branch of the tree of evolution. It was hexapodal. And it was a very good climber. It lived in the jungles of Otto. Now something happened after a while. On the planet the continent Otto sp split into Otto, which was now called Otto Prime, and the island chain called Isla. Isla housed a new species of the first one. And this new species was called Otria, or it meant in their name because they were sentient and they were smart they had the the maybe first fully developed brain called they were called otria and they were the first intelligent animal by their name. Otria means the intelligent one. Otria were special kind of people. They hunted in packs. They ate mainly fish, which were animals of the sea. So they li lived near, near the shoreline. They hunted and they lived on the Isla Island chain. But soon, they began making from the foliage around something akin to houses and they began living in societies in small societies of 5 to 10 in a generational way but there after a t 1 million year break the most intelligent o Otrian was not found in Isla Chain it was found on a simple island near it named Hip. And of course, the name of the species was Hippia. Hippia was the first 
hyper intelligent man. Not man, but man. Species. First hyper intelligent species. On the island chain, Autria has gone extinct by this point. And it was replaced by Autria Prime. They were still living in small communities and their skin was still green. Hippia was also green, but it had bigger communities. It had communities the size of a city. And this is where a story really starts. It isn't with a species or a way of life. It is with one human, which we now call Hippians, called nothing. He has no name. They haven't invented those yet. Why? Well, they didn't need them. Everybody knew who everybody was in small towns. But in a large town, which now happened to be, he needed a name. And he was the inventor of a name when he gave a name to his mother tree. And he gave a name and he said, I will name you, name you, Fiona. And he named himself second. The child of Piuna or Pionanin. And so Pionanin was born. Pionanin was a smart gentleman. Probably the smartest gentleman of his species up to that point. He was so smart, in fact, that he invented three things. The first thing he invented was fire. The second thing he invented was an axe. And the third thing he invented was sadly a sword. There were many inventions which followed. Many smarter beings than Puananin appeared, but he was the first. And his Puna lived for 1000 years producing geniuses each time it birthed anew. For you see, in this world, on this planet, with this flora and fauna, when the flora produces a human or any animal, it mostly inherits all the things, but it has more uh, oomph when a good tree produces a good human, it will produce a good human again. It's just a matter of time. So in her 1000 years of reign of Piuna, it produced many a genius. But this is not where our story begins. Our story begins later. Later, so much later in fact, that after one million years of evolution, Autria Prime has gone extinct, replaced by Piuna, Piuna Na, meaning children of Pi Piuna Na, Wahipians. Hip all those Hippians from before were Piuna. Now it was split in Piuna Na, which were inhabiting still the small uh, the small uh, hip island and a new species which did not name himself by Piuna but in such a good name was it that it lasted a million years Tria and Tria are the next hyper intelligent humans species. You see, they were good climbers, they lived in huts, they had heads, they ate grass as well, they had many limbs, 
two arms and two legs and another two arms and they lived in beautiful cities which are dained the life and, and the beauty of the, the beautiness and one day after a long long time from Punanan Punanin there was a child born and that child's name was given by other people because the tree cannot give the name. The name was Uya. Or as Trian say, the last Trian. He is the last Trian. Not because there is some spectacular shift in evolution, but because of a simple fact. That he was so smart, so cunning was he, that he changed the way of life for everyone forever. He asked a simple question, which many have asked before, where do we come from? And this question is so powerful that it defined the Tarian evolution forever. And they changed their name to honor him to Uyans. Uyans were now all humans born after Tria. After Uyan, of course. He changed it by, of course, inventing a god. This god's name was Iveritsa. Iveritsa was the first god, and he was the god, not of everything, nothing cringe like that. He was the god of full tummies. Such was the need for food, that he was a god for, of full tummies. By being a god of full tummies, he was the god of fruits, of labor, and so on. Now we shall go on in in a day of Uya's life. Uya, the first real man, the last Thrian, was a man living life to the fullest. He was an awful, awful cook. He just wanted to make the people happy. And so he did. By inventing a god, he took care of their mental struggles, not of their physical. Well, all that happened, before all that happened, there was a seven-legged creature, green creature of course, called Bagita. And Bagita wanted to kill a baby, but and I shit you not, but something stopped it. From doing that. And that something was a member of the species Mitia. So Mitian is from Mitter, of course, the Mitter continent, the Veta Prime, of course, the purple side. And Mitian stopped the creature from killing the child, and it was forever honored as that. And slowly, members of the Metean species, the purple ones, with four legs, which were wings, were honored as guests, as food guests, and so on. They were domesticated. This is the first domestification of any domestication. The seven legged Kisha Bagita, was domesticated as well, as a livestock. It would eat the grass, it would eat everything you throw at him, even meat, as it wanted each child. And so, Mithian, the flying dog, as some would call it, was born. They would have names, and they would have cute poses, which attracted members of uh, of uh, Uyans 
which had with them grace. So, 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 that is the story of Uya. And the dog called Mithian, not called Mithian, but from the species Mithian, it was a miracle, of course. Next thing Uya did will blow your mind. Uya was the first man to plant seeds of other creatures called Buga. So why, why would he plant the seeds of Buga? It was because they were simple small animals which could be cared for by eating grass. Buga were small and green and you could eat both them and their flora. So Buga seeds became a delicacy. You could grind them up and make something akin to bread. And soon Iverica, the first god full of tummies, which Uya created after a few thousand years, was renamed to the name of bread Pota, god of bread. God of bread and of course for Buga, Buga seeds had a Buga species, they had an animal form and the animal god of the animal forms, the delicacy, was named Bug, god of seed animals. Now seven-legged creatures Bagita could still be eaten and they were sometimes even preferred because they were tasty and their seventh leg was even a delicacy. But their plants were hard to grow. So you could only have so much of Buga, Bugita, Bagita. But you could have a lot of Buga. And you could have a lot of bread and a lot of Bug meat. And it would be amazing. Truly amazing. But given that, we just entered a new age. An age of bread and an age of seed animals. Now that we have Uyans, people stopped praying to Ivaritsa and Bagita are being farmed, farmed and Mithians are controlling the flock and Buga seeds are being melted down into soft beautiful bread the world can turn and they they exploded all around Otto Prime they were now Uyans and all around, they were living in beautiful cities and villages covered in mud. And in such one city, there lived a man. And the name of the man did not matter for the story. On grass so beautiful, in gold, not gold. There was a man, green skin, walking with his winged dog, named... Jo. He was called Iman. He was poor in food. He was hungry. One day he had lots of things to sell. For now, a whole robust economy occurred. And he was walking one day with, with Jo, wondering why it has four legs, four arms, four wings, as it were, in a beautiful tail. And he was thinking about if he should eat Joe. It crossed his mind, for he was really hungry. But he had no food again. And he had no animals, and he had no seeds. And he knew a man who had all of that. So he came to that man. The name of the man has been forgotten. <coughs> and he asked me, he asked him, Can I sell you Joe? And the man responded, sell me? What is sell? You want to give me Joe? No. I want to sell you Joe. What does sell mean? It means that I will give you Joe for some seeds. And the man said, I don't need Joe. Joe is useless to me. But I know someone who might need Joe. It is the old witch village 
she has something beautiful, of course, but she needs Joe. Maybe she'll allow you to get Joe. And he went to that other woman, the witch, and she said, you want to sell me Joe? And I said, no, I don't want to sell you Joe. I want to borrow you Joe. And they knew what borrow means. I said, for f wow, you're going to just borrow me Joe. That's, that's going to be amazing. And she said, no, but you got to give me seeds. And she said, no, I don't have seeds. And I said, what do you have? And he showed her, and she showed her, show him the beautiful set of dice. And she said, I have this. This is my grandmother's. The trees? Yes. Oh, well, not the trees. We all, we all have grandmothers. Our mothers are trees. But our grandmothers are, are beings. And she said, yeah, of course. How could I forget? So what if I bore you, Joe, for 10 days, then you return me, Joe, but I get that I set. And she said, fine, you have it. I don't know what you need this dice set for, Joe is amazing. I said, I'm hungry, but what are you going to eat the dice? She laughed at him off. She thought he was an insane maniac. And then he went to the man and said, I have this box of dice now. Do you want them? And she said, Yes, seeds, here, have them all. And he got 1,000 seeds. He planted some, and he ate some others. He got Joe 10 days later, and thought about his experience. He really thought about, what if I hadn't had Joe, but had something that which I didn't want? I would have to search all around the world for an exact thing that the man needed and I would never find it. it I was lucky and he thought Iman thought and Iman found a solution what if I have a rare item that everyone could have and I exchange it for Joe to others so I accept this item as something akin to currency and that's what uh, that's when money was made joe was joe was inspiring iman the first man to think of money iman was the richest man 7 years later he became so rich that others made jokes iman all owns all the black box what's the black box black box is money for black box was rare to find it was sort of a plant and this plant was delicious but it was rare and he would ex explain to others Give me something and I'll give me a beautiful blood box. And they'll just laugh him off. But then he started buying things. For the uh, selling things for blood box. And, and people were astonished. Dude, he was crazy. He was selling everything he had. He sold everything but Joe. And so. They started listening to him. They started using it. Because he explained it well. First transaction occurred with a woman named Pichtia and it was for a seven-legged creature with Blabax where of course Iman sold the seven-legged creature he had to find it first and then he sold it dead of course and then Seven, three, four, four, three, two, one, zero, two hour stream, two hour stream, zero viewers, two hour stream. <laughs> Money was green. So, 
in a spit of rage, people started calling the goddess of money Ta. And that's how money was made. Iman was truly a wondrous person. Iman's sister from the same tree was called Dida and she invented the needle by one she stabbed Joe once to heal his wounds and by stabbing him she thought of a way that they could make a smaller soul so it wasn't such a big of a wound and she could thread the needle and she could fix him up and she could he, and he could uh, f regrow in peace and so she did and so it was amazing and Joe lived to the ripe old age of 62 now now Iman was rich he could do whatever but this is not what our story ends people for 500 years later we are in a bustling nation state for now there exist countries people have banded together to fight other people for resources even though they were plentiful they fought for them and all was well in the city of Novi Pristan there lived a man called Yumir this man, Yumir, was in the capital city of Popoya. Capital city. Uh, he was in. He was in the capital. He was in the capital of Popoya. I'm sorry. He was in the capital of Popoya. He was very hungry, so he ate. Uh, this nation was by far the largest of the bunch it covered an area of 100 square kilometers Popoya was strong it was unrelenting Popoya was everything everything he knew he never left Popoya even though it would take a week to get anywhere, he never let, left Popoya and he was a proud Popoyan. He believed in gods, he thought they rewarded good and patience. He lived with his sisters, well, he nurtured his sisters. And, and he was fun and good to be around but Popoya was a bit lazy so when he made a solution of uh, of um, of buga seeds he uh, he left it for a month and it and after, even though a month passed in the complete darkness of his room, he returned and drank it foolishly. When he drank it, he felt a soaring pain stabbing his tongue. And he decided to drink more. As he drink, drank, he started to feel dizzy and after a while he started going around the city butt naked screaming about how he didn't see the gods this was concerning how can you see the gods they said how can you know what gods cannot he continued screaming and he continued making a fool of himself but he now knew a recipe to make everyone the god and so he did he became the second richest person in history after Iman 
well, Iman was poorer than than uh, than uh, Yumir. Yumir was really, really rich. He made mansions, and after a while, a dynasty of his formed, where his trees were thought to be sacred and produced heirs for a thousand years, and their seeds made the heirs, and so on. And that dynasty lasted for a thousand years. And as a gesture towards his greatness, he invited all of the architects, architects, uh, architects, architects, all around the world and all around Popoya to make him a monument that would befit his greatness. And so he made an, something he loved, he adored. He had a mathematician. He, that mathematician was named Non. And he found out that there were five platonic shapes. Five shapes which have all equal sides and all equal angles. And not constantly scorned Ymir that he, he did not uh, understand that. So Ymir decided to play a prank on him. And even though he didn't understand him, he would be arrested in one of them. He would die in one of them. He would live forevermore in one of them. And so he made the Icosahedron Palace, or also named Icos. The Icosahedron Palace was huge. And after him, five after him, they decided that the Icosahedron Palace befits a tree. So they put a tree in it. That tree's name was forgotten. But the next tree would have another palace. And the palaces would go on and on until the sixth came. By, by that point, the, the, the empire of Papaya... Popeye was long dead and only ashes remained but the whole five palaces of platonic shapes were built the 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 icosahedron the square the dodecahedron the octahedron and the uh, tet tetraeder they were all built and all housed great trees. It took thousands upon tens of thousands of people working with their sweat to make this thing a reality. And Popoya was known all around the globe as the place you come to visit to find the most beauty in the world. And I'm gonna draw them now. This is the Square Palace. It was insanely large. And people lived in it. All the maids, all the everyone lived in it. The cooks, from the king up to the up to the emperor, when the emperor came, of course. But not everything would be beautiful, Popoya. For even though these were the five wonders of the world, every wonder in the world was in Popoya. There would be a nation next to Popoya which would overtake it. And that nation was Zamax. Well, you see, uh, Zamax did not have much food, so they needed to conquer. And Popoya was rich. It was beautiful. It was... The, the Bava seeds, Baga seeds were made to be planted and eaten in, in Popoya. But... Zamax was not that. So they needed to do something to get other people's things. At first, the generations were, would just go and war and kill and take. Some would diplomacy uh, their way out of it. But 
there was a nation that did something. Uh, Zamax was a nation that did something incredible. Incredible. They started to innovate, and to innovate, they did. They created weapons of war, ways to make more bread by by just yeasting it up, ways to to make uh, animals as large as elephants wage war with you. The seven-legged creature was no longer just a silly thing you eat, but it was a weapon. Bagitas all, all around the battlefield eating the dead. It was a very gruesome tactic, and, and Popoya would not survive it. Popoya would die, and the new emperor of Zamax would take the throne of Popoya and would live in the Icosahedron Palace. But the Dotecohedron Palace was built a bit far from the others. And Popoya did not survive, but another nation called Ila would just take the, the throne there. It would defend against Zamax and it would survive, it would innovate. And so began the age of Zamax and Ila. Zamax and Ila weren't buddies, but they needed to cooperate sometimes. Zamax now had the finest of grain and Ila had the mines of a century. Ila made great scientists. Actually, Ila made the first scientist who we're gonna be talk about next. The first scientist was named Sie. Sie? Sie? Sie was the first scientist. And he taught a lot of shit. A lot of things which later scientists would come and say was completely false. He was not just the first scientist, he was the first historian. And as the first historian, he lied a lot. And he lied so much that in history and science, there is a term called sietic. And sietic thing means fake, in a sense. It doesn't mean true, it's, it's fake. But his legacy would stay with the thinking that the world did not all, uh, the, the, the world uh, was not a static place, but revolved around the two suns which were surrounding it. And he thought that we didn't just revolve around the suns, but evo revolved around the moons as well, which people laughed at him. How could that be the case? They are small, look at them, they're in the sky, they are nothing. So, after a while, Sia discovered many laws, like the law that when you push an object, it tires and it stops after a while. He discovered that when you push water, it doesn't shrink, it goes, you can use water to move things. He found this corkscrew that you can move water in. He found a lot of things. A lot of crazy things in that. He made war machines to help Ilya, if, to help Lia lead the war and not fall into Zamax. And once he even got a corpse for plant to figure out what it's made of and how do we come out of there? He made the first, the first crossbow, and he made a lot of other things. So Sia was impressive, and he is three even more so. He was born and raised as a devout follower of, uh, of, uh, of Fota. He loved to eat, and especially bread. 
he was incredible, just incredible individual. And he lived after a while with the king of Ila in the Dodecahedron Palace. Now our story ends. Next time we're going to talk about the war, the innovations and the future of this planet. What's going to happen? Who's going to fight? What's going to be? Thank you for listening.